Hello, everyone. I think it's important to recognize that we live in the future, the future. I think for many of you in the audience, you grew up with the original Blade Runner, and you have to recognize that this is now the present, right? We have flying cars. We have video screens that are built on the roofs of entire stadiums just for airplanes. I am presenting in front of a, looks like a two millimeter pixel pitch screen. Minority Report is well over 20 years old at this point. It, what technologies that looked extraordinary back then are just average commonplace now. You can find those same technologies in your local convenience store. Star Trek, we had the holodeck. This is now how Hollywood and most video production companies produce things, where you can create these scenarios of being anywhere at any time. This problem with smart buildings is that to date, they've largely been conceived of networks of thousands or tens of thousands of sensors vacuuming up huge amounts of data. We're not taking that data and implementing it back to create great experiences for the people of those buildings, right? We're at best delivering some dashboards on apps or maybe optimizing how you book your conferences. And I think there's a tremendous amount more that we could do. The rest of the world is started to use digital projection, digital surfaces across a host of applications. You have your theme parks, you have museums using this to create radical new for, uh, art and experiences. You have even food chains and bar chains now using projection mapping and interactivity to create new experiences that drive new values. You're seeing a revolution in how sports are conceived, how they're used. So this begs the question of if every surface becomes a digital screen, now what? How do we change the way we think of building design, of building applications? First off, we can have digital media screens in every crazy format you want. You start by making digital screens in any shape. You can make it as complicated as you want. You can then make them curved. You can then take shapes and curves, and suddenly you can do compound curves like these fluted column capitals, which if you're familiar with construction, you know in any building material, this is a difficult shape to do. We can now do this in video. So you wind up with this potential of putting video on any surface in any format at any scale at any size that you want. Um, this is a company called O'Color Technologies. I follow them on LinkedIn. They post all these crazy videos. I mean, you can do video now in a Mobius curb, which is just um, amazing. Uh, if you think about it, it was maybe, what, 20 years ago, we were still using Sony Trinitrons. You can now do videos where it's a complete seamless corner. You can do video in round circles, right? We can do video in perfect spheres, uh, faceted, cur uh, incredible compositions like this. This is not projection mapping. This is an actual LED video screen. The problem with digital signage right now is I think most of you probably flew in through an airport. You went through train stations, and there's signage everywhere. How much of it did you actually pay attention to? Any of it? Well, this crowd probably did because we, we, we sell it, we all look at it. The reality of it is, is we're all burned out on digital signage. And there's design techniques here that we can use. First off, you start, this is just another screen. Nobody pays attention to it, I guarantee you. You can make this as big as you want, it doesn't matter. Can we break the proportions? Can we change the scale so it becomes something more than just a screen, so it almost becomes immersive? Can we? layer visual acuity where we have high resolution screens surrounded by low resolution screens. Can we then start to turn that more into integrated spatial experiences where we have different media at different scales? Perhaps we have high resolution in the middle, we have low resolution screens around the side, and we just have sort of digital lighting around the perimeter. But then there's this leap into the crazy world. Um, if Frank Gehry had video as a building material, what would he do with it? Sadly, this is actually an image I made in 1999 for my graduate thesis uh, for my master's in architecture. So the concepts have been around for a long time. It just hasn't been used very well. The next thing that we should talk about is this obsession with VR and the metaverse. VR has been around since the early 90s. I mean, there's obvious problems with it. It's antisocial. It's awkward to use. The technology is not very good. And I'd like to challenge you to think that based on my sort of back of the envelope calculation, if I'm standing from a screen like this, about roughly a meter away, roughly arm's length away, if it goes sub 0.5 millimeter pixel pitch, you lose perception of pixels, which means you sort of have the Apple retina-like sensation where you have just a perfect screen. 
So that means if I'm standing in front of a screen like this, I cannot see the edges. If this is 0.5 millimeters or not, it becomes a virtual reality experience in real life. So if you have something like this, where <clears throat> it's just a simple room, um, this is a Fusion CIS Studios. They just did this piece of showing a simple sunrise. You cannot perceive if this is reality or a screen at some point. These LED screens have daylight brightness already. The resolution is so high, the content is so pure that this is a new form of virtual reality. Maybe we call it architectural reality. I don't know what the term should be for it. Another thing we can talk about is this growing trend for anamorphic graphics. It's an old, timeless painting technique, Trump Loy, forced, per forced perspective. You can see this all over. But in digital media, you're starting to see these crazy applications where um, large screen signage now looks 3D. This is not 3D. If you see very closely, this is a large curving corner, right? So you can do forced perspective on 2D flat screens. The moment you add a second corner or a second axis, um, you can really get stunning effects. Now, what really works here is when you're in a tight urban environment and you only have sort of one view corridor, this doesn't work from any other angles. But at the scale of a building, you will very quickly see rooms that are all surfaces of digital media. Right? And if you noticed what happened when he walked in here, you immediately lost where you were. You were immersed in a virtual environment nearly completely. If you notice this one more time. And it's, um, I think in our industry, we forget that this is very powerful. I love this cute little video of these kids. Listen to them as they crest this roller coaster. Um, this is a glass floor. The video goes underneath them, around them. Virtual reality at the scale of architecture, right? And this is not even very good graphics. This looks like graphics from about 20 years ago. Transparency and layered realities. Again, I used an image I made from my thesis in 1999. I can't believe I'm showing you student work I did that's two decades old, but here I am. If you know lighting, you know lighting is additive, right? And this is a trick that the old timers have used in special effects. So theatrical scrims, where you fade from one thing to another, or uh, Disney has used this with the Pepper's Ghost effect. When you start to have digital content as a surface that can be on anything and can be any transparency level, you have to start layering reality and virtual reality, and you can start to use your body as a control system for that. You think about James Trell and the famous light effects where he does apertures and what's beyond or what's in front of it. This might be easier to understand. You already have screens that at various scales look transparent. So at the architectural scale, you have these LED screens. Um, at the finer scale, you have transparent OLED, right? And when you start to combine that, you can have, let's say, solid surfaces. You can have transparent surfaces. If they really wanted to here, they could add in some props or reality, or they could add multiple screens that are transparent to create a tremendous illusion of depth and parallax effect. This is the Petite Chef, and this is a uh, restaurant experience that's now, I think this is on a cruise ship. What this is, is forced perspective overlaid onto a dining room table. And the only trick here really is that the plate has to be in the right spot. Everything else works. And it's just a charming overlay of data and media um, in storytelling on your dining experience. And then you start to turn this into um, these very lush dining experiences where you combine projection mapping on the table surrounded by these walls of high resolution digital media, you get a total new type of immersion where you have your physical stuff, your food, and you have your virtual experience surrounding you. And obviously this has a lot of hospitality and entertainment applications, but how do we start to use this technology in let's say healthcare or retail or commercial office spaces? Another comp set I like to talk about, ambient communications. We as humans have very focused vision that we look at for acute detail. This vision costs our brain a lot. It takes a lot of processing power. But we have a secondary visual system that's our peripheral vision. This is a very fast, lightweight, low uh, mental energy sort of visual system. And it is very powerful. Um, I think earlier today in the session, you saw all the lights went white for some reason, and everybody looked, what went on? What went on? Why was that? That was our peripheral vision system working. We weren't focused on the lighting. 
Well, I was, I'm a lighting nerd, but the rest of us weren't, and you saw that. So we have this peripheral vision, we have this human proclivity for motion, right? Maybe it's because we wanted to make sure we saw the lion in the bushes uh, eons ago before it ate us, and we have this human proclivity for meaning making of variables in our environment change, we want to know why. Well, how do we use ambient communications within a physical space to, to optimize that space, to optimize the human behavior in there? We can do a lot of things. We could change the color of the space. We could change the motion intensity. There's a lot of things, the patterns of light. And then this was an example I used of how do we drive that? What, what are we using to feed that control system? Well, we could feed that with live data streams. We could feed it with the weather or the stock market, or we could feed it with social media content or data, or perhaps in the uh, realm of smart buildings, we're feeding this with social media from an internal company group, right? So we can have the data on the left feeding the effects on the right, and here's a few examples of what this might look like. Let's say you wanna show uh, progress towards a cause or progress towards a goal. So we could take the aggregation of likes and fill up an architectural wall on the side. Um, let's say in a retail environment, we had a mannequin showing a piece of clothing. We have the piece of clothing online. We could map the rate of purchases to the rate of the lighting effect in the store so that a manager of the store could just see with a glance saying, aha, that's really hot online right now. I wonder what's going on. Um, another example could be called sparkling service, where in a restaurant you have a beautiful animated digitally controlled sparkling wall. We could take the aggregated rate of uh, or average likes or stars and apply that to the rate of the sparkle on the wall surface. So, and you see how this maps through. Let's talk about interactivity now. For many, many years, I mean, tw two decades at least, we've been able to precisely map where people are in space and do lighting effects around that. But why? You know, we can, we can touch, we can use our physical proximity, we can use the occupancy in a space, we can have very precise camera, you know, stereo vision tracking, and we can tag in with our identity. And normally, this is when the conversation gets sidetracked with privacy, privacy issues, tracking, big brother, and that's, that's really, wrong. That's not the way to think about this. It, within architectural space, we have phases of anonymity, right? All the way on the left, we have no systems at all. You walk through a space, you're totally untracked, you're a ghost. We have systems, though, that can track you. Let's say um, the faucet that recognizes your presence and turns on. Nobody cares, nobody's screaming privacy about that, but you are being tracked in a certain form. And then you have an interface, but you're not recognized. Then you have the moment where you check in, and there's lots of applications where your privacy, you have to check in. You go to an airport, you go to a hotel, you go to healthcare. Those are all check-in applications. You go to retail and you want service, and you will see levels of basic data. You'll see levels of tailored service all the way up to the extreme where you have this sort of genie-like magic because the system has learned so much about you and your actions that it can create things nobody was even expecting. Um, any kid can download TensorFlow, which is open source software, and put it on a $20 Raspberry Pi and do vision tracking systems nowadays. Pro systems like Avertima here can actually sort out, can guess what your sex and age is, they can track you, they can track your linger time. And then once you combine check-in with a CRM system, you can do camera recognition system. They can recognize who you are before you even have to say who you are or tag in. So why? Well, we can deliver function, we can deliver delight, we can deliver content. These are all valuable things. And I think you see most smart building systems are not even thinking about this. They're delivering very narrow financial ROI objectives and they're not looking at the broader experiences. This is a, a healthcare facility, I think somewhere in the United Kingdom by Jason Bruges Studio. So these are very sick kids going for MRI or CAT scans. They get very nervous. Hospitals are a very imposing environment. So they put this LED screens behind the wallpaper, little magical animals show up. It calms the kids, it distracts them. They got much better scans. So there was a very clear ROI in the big dollar world of healthcare just by distracting children. Again, these are very timeless principles. This is another piece from my thesis. You can map within an architectural space, active surfaces, active zones, active objects against our eyes, our bodies, and our hands. 
and this becomes sort of a new toolkit about how we can experience space. You can also map surfaces, objects, and zones against the color, luminosity, texture, dynamics. And I think what we'll see very quickly, though, is that the next generation are going to look at this and then figure out what the ROI is on each of those effects. So we have new design technologies that drive all this. This is uh, from Scandal Tech, which is a data-driven lighting control system. And where smart building systems are at are basically here. They kind of create a large amount of cloud data from systems. Maybe they have some advanced sensing, maybe not. And that's about it. But we're going to have systems that take data input along with data tables, like I said, social media, whatever your data content is, that we have processing that has if-then logic systems that make sense mixed with media content, mixed with abstraction engines, and then outputted to um, every form of light emitting thing you could imagine. Um, a 4K screen is really just 23 million little points of light. So every pixel becomes a light source, every light source becomes a pixel in the buildings going forward. You also have uh, live rendering technologies. Unreal Engine is basically eating the world, as they say. It's eating the world in architectural construction right now for any sort of visualization. Um, it's become so quick to put Revit content into Unreal. Now what's staggering is that Unreal, which is a game engine, it's used to make high-end pro game systems. It has all the interactivity that you need to do the most mind-blowing games is in here. You can put a BIM model into here and start doing all that game interactivity. People have made extensions now where you can control DMX lighting. Once you control DMX, you can control anything in the physical world from your game engine. So this is an example where they have an Unreal Engine in Denver controlling RGB lights across the Atlantic in Amsterdam, compositing it in real life. In fact, I, I propose to you that the Unreal Engine will probably be a better platform for smart buildings than almost any previous BMS system going forward. Another real hot concept, we're seeing retail media networks. You have these omni-channel collections of data, right, where you have physical data, but you mostly have a lot of online data. The retail world is struggling on how to synthesize all of this data, connect it all so you have a seamless shopping experience, whether you're in-store or online. Plus what I just talked about, so you're adding in interactions within the store, your physical actions, your physical presence. This is valuable advertising space. So you have Walmart, you have Target, you have all these Walgreens trying to monetize this as a new form of media network where they can sell advertising space within their stores with the precision of online advertising. So you start to look at these buildings as you can drive a building two ways. You can drive it through data-driven environmental optimization or you can drive it through media-driven branded experiences. Generally, I like to think of the data-driven stuff as more anonymous and the brand-driven stuff as more personalized, but that's not a hard and fast rule. And this is a company called Cooler Screens. They're creating an entire platform for distributing content exactly to the right demographics that they want. So when you go into your local convenience store, you now see full screen advertisements. So I leave you with this. The challenge we have is we have to combine smart building systems with all the halls over there that have the digital signage. We have to combine that with architecture. Right? We have to learn how to optimize a place using all these technologies. We have to think about the difference between placemaking versus immersive experience. And we have to think about the influencing character of a place for you know, that 330-300 divide between the real estate, the energy, and the people costs in these facilities. This is a, a, a wild area of new exploration. I think you're going to see a lot more professional jobs and companies focusing on this um, for optimization. So, Last slide, you know, we live in a world where the future is now. We already can put video throughout buildings just as easily as we can specify gyp and paint or oak panels, right? This is the present already. Um, what are we going to do with it? Feel free to email me if you'd like. Check out my blog at lucep.com where I cover this stuff or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you.